Well, I've been thinking about 10 people all week. I just can't seem to get them out of my mind. 10. Not 11, not 6, but 10. And I want to talk with you about them here in a moment. But first, let's talk about what's on all of our minds. Thanksgiving, right? Thanksgiving. Can you believe it? It is here this Thursday, and we're all trying to figure out, figure out how to navigate safely this holiday. Now, over the years, I've heard a number of people say, you know, this is my favorite holiday of all, Thanksgiving. I think I understand that. Low stress. No presents to buy. No gifts to wrap. No tree to decorate. No parties to attend. Just time together with family. And a delicious meal. And maybe a little football. Oh, oh, oh. And what else? Maybe to pause and give thanks. That would be good, wouldn't it? Now, these past couple of Sundays, we've been in a series, a sermon series entitled The Act of Prayer. You know that. It's on your bulletin cover. And how our prayer lives ought to have some balance like healthy diets have some balance. You know, not all asking, not all about my concerns and my needs and my wants and my desires. Now, there's nothing wrong with asking. Indeed, Scripture encourages us to bring our concerns to the Lord, but some of us never get past that, <laughs> asking. We never remember the, the A and the C and the T in the act of prayer. That is adoration and confession. And that brings us to today, Thanksgiving. So that's what we're going to focus on this morning. On not forgetting to give thanks to, to God who has done so much for us and does so much for us even now. Now that brings me back to those 10 people whom I cannot get out of my mind. Luke is the one who tells us about them and their plight and their good fortune. It all started at a border crossing. Jesus was on his way. It seemed like he was always on his way somewhere, and he was on his way from, well, from the Galilee to Jerusalem, and he was passing across the border between Samaria and the Galilee, and that is where the event happened. The Bible says, as Jesus was entering a village, yes, <laughs> right there at the border, 10 lepers, 10 men started calling out to him. Now, this was not the local chamber of commerce, mind you. No. Turns out these men were all suffering from, from leprosy. They were lepers, all 10 of them. And this morning, I want us to focus on one of them. I'm sorry, I, I can't tell you his name. Uh, Luke doesn't give it. We don't know, but we do learn one thing about this man which quickly causes us to admire him, which makes him stand out from all the rest. And we'll get to that in a few moments. But first, I would like for us to notice how these 10 were all alike. Well, they all had a dreaded skin disease an incurable disease, and it was contagious. Now, plagues and contagion, that's something we can better understand these days, isn't it? It's not just biblical times. We get it. 
Let's just do the math. Incurable disease. Uh, contagious. What does that equal? Fear. Fear. And people feared these 10 lepers like the plague. I mean, there was no vaccination on the way. And they carried the virus, shall we say. And as a result, they were, they were cast out of the community. They were shunned. They were socially distanced. We get that, don't we? And so that's why Luke tells us that they stood at a distance. They had to. That's what the law required. You get it. We understand social distancing and the need for it. And so they had leprosy. And they were feared. And there is another way that they were all alike. They had put aside some old issues. Uh, some old grudges, some stereotypes, some racial issues that no longer mattered. Now, they needed one another. Race and ethnicity and prejudice, oh, all that now was secondary. Jew, Samaritan, these categories didn't seem to matter any longer. Because these 10 had bigger problems to worry about. And so old barriers were broken down. And that border which once divided them, it didn't matter any longer. They were just people, just people, desperate people, sharing the same disease trying to survive together. Funny how desperate situations can give us a new perspective on life, isn't it? <laughs> About what's important, really important, and what's not. Now, you know what else these 10 lepers had in common? It seems to me, as I read the scripture, and that is, a desire to live. I mean, they weren't, they were doomed to die, but they weren't going to take this lying down. <laughs> no. They weren't giving up yet. So when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they stood up. They stood up and they started yelling at him. By this time, everybody, it seems, knew about Jesus. I mean, this prophet who possessed extraordinary healing power. And so they stood, but at a distance. Luke says, they stood at a distance. And they cried out to him in a loud voice. That's what the Bible says, a loud voice. Jesus, Master, have pity on us. They were pleading for help. Now, I don't know if these were praying men before Jesus passed by or not. I don't know. Luke doesn't say. But they sure prayed now. Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Oh, <laughs> desperate situations have a way of getting our attention and turning our thoughts heavenward, don't they? Desperate situations. Now, what happens next? It is so interesting. When Jesus saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. That just seems strange to me. It, it's, it seems odd. I mean, the Bible doesn't say that Jesus healed them, the Bible doesn't say that they were cleansed. The Bible doesn't say that their skin turned normal. The Bible doesn't say that their feelings were turned to their limbs. No. 
What the scripture says, the text says, is that Jesus told them, go, show yourselves to the priests. Can you just imagine one leopard turning to another and saying, why does he want us to do that? And another leopard may have piped in, yeah, I don't get it. But they obeyed. Oh, that's something else that they shared in common. Obedience. They all obeyed. They took Jesus at his word. They followed his directions. Now here's a question. Why do you suppose Jesus instructed them to go show themselves to the priests? Seems odd, doesn't it? Why? Because there was a ritual that one must go through to be declared clean. There was a ritual that one must go through in order to be welcomed back into the community. And only priests could perform that ritual, and only priests could declare them clean. And oh, if you want afternoon reading, that ritual is described in detail in the Old Testament, all the way back to the book of Leviticus, the 13th, and the 14th chapters. Oh yes, you can almost hear another leper complaining, why is he sending us to the priest? Nothing has changed. We're not any different. Oh, those holy men, they're just gonna throw rocks at us and run us off again. Well, maybe we should read the entire verse and then it will make sense. Chapter 17, Luke's gospel, verse 14. When Jesus saw them, he said, go show yourself to the priests. And then Luke says, and as they went, they were cleansed. My friends, in the Bible, we find that Jesus had many ways of healing people. For the blind man, he took some mud and some saliva, and he put it on the man's eyelids. For Lazarus, he simply called him by name and, and commanded him to come forth from the grave, back to life. For the paralytic, he first asked a question, do you want to be well? And then Jesus said, rise up, pick up your bed and walk. Sometimes Jesus touched people. Other times he just spoke, spoke words of healing over them. In the case of these men with leprosy, he did neither. Instead, Jesus told them to go present themselves to the priest. He asked them to take a risk, to begin walking by faith. Oh, their condition, it might have seemed hopeless to them. But as they walked, they began to feel again. And new life began to enter their, their veins. Ten lepers. Alike in so many ways. But here, here is where their likeness ends. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back. The Bible says he, he was praising God in a loud voice. And then he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And then Luke adds this interesting detail. He was, and he was, a Samaritan. That's all. No dwelling on the fact, just noting it, like a footnote. That could be a sermon all in itself, couldn't it? But, but that's not where we're heading this morning. We'll take up that another time. But let's just let the facts on the ground sink in for a moment. Ten. Ten healed. Only one, only one came back to say thank you. Hard to imagine, isn't it? Except that that's what happens in life so often, that we fail to express gratitude. I mean, how could that be? 
I, I'm sure that these other nine, I, I, I'm just sure they had their reasons for, for not coming back. We, we don't know the reasons. We can speculate about those nine. Maybe one wanted to see if the cure was real, if it would stick. <laughs> Maybe that's it. Maybe one rationalized in his mind, well, I'll, be, I'll see Jesus later. First, I must rush home. Maybe so. Maybe another decided, you know, I don't think I really ever had leprosy in the first place. False diagnosis. <laughs> Maybe another one said to himself, well, I think I was getting better already anyway. I don't know. We don't know. What we do know is that these nine started on the road just long enough for it to sink in, and then they began to scatter. Back to the farm, back to family, back to their wives' arms, to their, to their babies. I, we don't know. But within a few moments, they had all stampeded off, and the road was empty except for this one man. And he's looking up the road, can't you imagine? Where his companions had vanished. And I would suspect that he also was thinking of home, of family, of the business. I can start the business again. Of seeing friends after those months, maybe years of being forcibly distanced from the community. But there was one thing more pressing than all of that. I must first go back to the man who cured me, who has given me back my life. And so he turns, but he turns alone. And he makes his way to Jesus in total gratitude, and he falls at his feet. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Well, there you have the picture. Ten, oh, they start. Ten. They, ten, they go to plead. Only one returns to praise. We're a lot better at pleading than we are at praising, aren't we? Now, wasn't I right in saying a few moments ago that this man is worth knowing? Why was one grateful and the other nine not? That's a good question. Why? Well, we can observe it's not a difference in circumstances. They were all the same, all cast out by society, all feared. And it's not a difference in circumstances. It's not a difference in outcome. All were healed, not just one. Then we could understand, but all were healed. The only difference, it seems, was their response. Someone has said, I didn't, I read this. Someone has said that there are basically two kinds of people. There are those who have a sense of gratitude and those who have a sense of entitlement. Can we think about that for a moment? Two basic approaches to life. Gratitude or entitlement. And for those who live with a sense of gratitude, nothing is taken for granted. Everything is seen as a blessing. But for those who live with a sense of entitlement, everything, it seems, is just taken for granted. And therefore, nothing can truly be appreciated. Now, I know it's cliche to say, but I couldn't think of another way to put it. And so here it is, because it's so true. Gratitude is an attitude. A recognition of our blessings in, in spite of circumstances. Because there's almost always something to be thankful for if we just look. Am I right? Have you ever wondered about those first pilgrims, what they had to be thankful for, that 
first Thanksgiving, you know, the famous painting representing a true experience, a true scene, where the pilgrims and the friendly Indians or Native Americans were feasting together before mountains of food, as the picture has it, but it doesn't adequately tell the story, does it? Because that, thing, that first Thanksgiving for the pilgrims found half their number gone, already dead. They didn't have even the barest of comforts, and food was more scarce than the picture depicts. And, and they were alone in a faraway land, and yet, in the midst of all of that hardship, they still expressed gratitude to God. That's what's so amazing. It wasn't for comfort. They didn't have comfort. No, it wasn't for ma the materialistic things of life. They had none of those. No, their thanksgiving was one of hope and faith. And it was the same sense of hope and faith that enabled the apostle Paul himself when he sat in a dingy prison cell in Rome to write first. First, I give thanks to God through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So interesting. First, I give thanks to God for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There's, a, there's almost always something to be thankful for if we will just look. You know that the book, the classic Robinson Crusoe. It's been made into a movie numerous times. Numerous. Go online. You can see. There's even Robinson Crusoe on Mars. That was a big one. <laughs> you remember the storyline. It was first written as a spiritual tale, to a, sort of a moral tale. Robinson Crusoe, he's the lone survivor of a shipwreck. He washes up on a deserted island, and it's a bleak situation, <laughs> bleak. He named that island the Isle of Despair. But the very first thing that he did was to make a list. And on the one side of the list, he would write down all of his problems. And on the other side, he would write down his blessings. And so on one side he wrote, I have no clothes. On the other side he wrote, but it's warm and I don't really need any. On one side he wrote, all the provisions were lost. On the other side he wrote, I'm paraphrasing, but there's plenty of fresh fruit and water on the island. And on and on he went. And what he discovered was that for every negative aspect of his situation, there was something positive that he could look to. Something to be thankful for. Friends, when we find ourselves on the Isle of Despair, when we've got the COVID blues, <laughs> Maybe we should sit down and take an inventory of our blessings. My guess is that we still have much, much that we can be thankful for. Now, some of you here will remember a country western songwriter and singer named Jimmy Dean. He died about 10 years ago. But even if you're not a, a country western fan, you've probably eaten his sausage, right? Jimmy Dean. Well, he co-wrote a song that reflects a feeling of gratitude. It's called Drinking from My Saucer. Isn't that good? Don't you love country western music? I went online yesterday. You can I went online to listen to him sing that song. One line goes like this. So Lord, Help me not to gripe about the tough rows that I've hoed. I'm drinking from my saucer because my cup has overflowed. Isn't that good? The grammar may be a little rough, but it's country western after all. And the sentiment is altogether right on. I'm drinking from my saucer 
because my cup has overflowed. That is a feeling of gratitude. Thank you, Lord. My life might have had some tough rows in it to hold, but the good times have outnumbered the bad, and I am grateful. Now, can't we agree that even during this worldwide pandemic, going on for some, I don't know how you count it, maybe 10 months now, something like that, can't we still agree that the good in our lives outweighs the bad? That we've got so much to be grateful for. I mean, our country, the greatest nation on the face of the earth, our freedoms, the freedom to assemble, to worship as we please, the freedom of speech, the freedom to be tried by a jury of our peers. Oh, freedom. Our country, the greatest economy on earth, the best hospitals and medical care in all the world. I mean, we have a hard time dying anymore. It's getting so good. <laughs> hard to do business for that columbarium. These doctors are just doing such a good job. Unparalleled research teams bringing us a vaccination at a record speed. So much to be thankful for. For an education system, a marvelous education system, public and private, with dedicated teachers and qualified administrators. Not every place has that, but we do. And I'm grateful. And I'm thankful for family, aren't you? And for colleagues at work. And I'm thankful for this wonderful church, for its passion for winning people to Jesus, for its passion for, for missions and for helping people in need. And I am so proud of the way this church invests in its youth and its children. And, and I'm thankful for a caring ministry of this church, which is, I mean, it is profound and vast. <laughs> and the way that we've invested in special needs ministry, most recently, from monies from the foundation and some from missions and some from special gifts, investing another $700 plus thousand dollars for the special needs space. Literally, after the first service, I find mail on my desk and one was a card, I almost brought it to read it to you, from a parent of special needs saying, thank you, pastor, so much. And I'm so happy about our partnership with Brookwood so we can provide opportunities for those special needs kids and special needs adults five days a week plus what we do on Sunday. Yes, I am thankful, my friends, for this wonderful church, for its worship services, for its inspiring music Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, which speaks to our hearts. Oh, let's focus on our blessings. We can focus on our blessings or we can complain about our problems. It is, after all, our choice. Can you imagine what those nine were feeling? The ones that seemingly had this, you know, attitude of entitlement. What they might have been thinking or saying to one another as they walked down that road. We don't know. Luke doesn't say. We can just speculate. One might have said, I wonder if I'm going to have to file a medical insurance claim because of this. I hate that insurance paperwork. <laughs> Another might have said, well, I guess I don't have an excuse not to spend Thanksgiving with my in-laws this year. <laughs> Another might have said, I just wish I'd remembered to ask Jesus to do something about my allergies while he was at it. <laughs> it's about attitude, isn't it? Some of you know the author. You've read some of his books. He's so good. Max Licato. In one of his books entitled Traveling Light, Max tells about a missionary who was leading a worship service at a leper colony. Yes, a leper colony on the island of Tobago. And the missionary opened the service with song requests. You know, we just call out. And people give the... That's when it happened. That's when 
it happened, something that the missionary had never expected and was not prepared for, a horribly disfigured woman requested the song, Count Your Many Blessings. And so the piano started playing and they started singing. And the worshipers were singing enthusiastically, but the missionary just bowed his head and was silent, too overcome by emotion. Sometime later, he was telling about that experience to a friend. And the friend said, well, I suppose you'll never be able to sing that song again, Jim. And the missionary, he paused for a moment, and then he answered, no, I'll sing it. I'll sing it. But just never in the same way. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your blessings. See what God has done. Jesus asked, were, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned, has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Here's my question to you, to, to me, for all of us this morning. Do you want to be like the nine, or do you want to be like the one? The man who came back, the man who did not forget, the man who expressed gratitude. The act of prayer, it goes beyond just asking, doesn't it? Adoration, confession, and thanksgiving. Oh, thanksgiving. Let's not forget that, especially this week. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.